please join me in welcoming David Laidlaw. All right. The topic today I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about is uh, the future of Alberta waters um, and the uh, implications of Indigenous rights. And despite my appearance, uh, I'm not a member of any of Canada's First Nations. Um, I'm actually half Hawaiian. <laughs> so it's a long story, but we won't go there. So, <laughs> anyway, I want to talk about Canada pre-contact. Canada was occupied by Indigenous nations who had a different worldview. And that worldview comes clear in their origin stories. So, for example, generally speaking, um, Indigenous peoples lived with their creator in the world. And everything was created for a sacred purpose. And so that worldview led to respecting everything in the world, including uh, other animals, other plants, flora, fauna, um, and to understand the interrelationships within that world. In contrast, the Western view from the Bible, which is called, you know, the great code of, as Northrop Fry described it, God expelled humans from paradise, the Garden of Eden. And so they weren't in paradise. They didn't live with their creator in the world. The creator gave man dominion over animals and plants. So that led to a difference in viewpoint where Western perspectives focused on control and domination. And those are two very different world, world views. Indigenous laws governed the relationships uh, within the group and the relationship with the environment. They were sovereign nations. They held lands in defined territories that were owned um, by the indigenous groups, indigenous nations. And they obtained their livelihood from the bounties of the land and water. So, at contact, most of the West Indigenous nations in Western Canada first encountered uh, fur traders from the Hudson's Bay Company. The Hudson's Bay Company charter in uh, 1670 granted, established the Hudson's Bay Company, and granted monopoly trading rights in Prince Rupert's land. Those were the lands that were defined as being uh, those draining into the Hudson's Bay by the rivers. And it constituted the colony of, Prince, of Rupert's Land with Hudson's Bay Company as, quote, lords and proprietors with the power to make laws convenient for good government of the said territory and all employees in any of those territories. Of course, in practice, the Hudson's Bay Company confined itself to claiming territories around its trading posts and laws for its employees. And this is Rupert's Land. Those are all the territories that drain into the Hudson's Bay. The fur trade. Western Canadian Indigenous nations had some trading relationships based on kinship uh, with other First Nations, but the fur trade provided the first opportunity to enter into the early capitalist international market system. In the fur trade, in return for Western supplies, such as food, guns, uh, medicines, and clothing, indigenous nations provided excess furs they'd harvested. They also gave local labor and provided supplies for the trading post, and the furs would be forwarded to Europe for sale. This was a cooperative relationship, with Western supplies being extended, often on credit, to ensure future supplies of fur. And for example, they would uh, provide clothing in the form of Hudson's Bay blankets to have uh, the labor that would have been devoted to tanning hides and furs being devoted to hunting. 
And in the meantime, they provided uh, indigenous people, nations with um, supply, Western supplies, in order to ensure the security of the future supplies of those furs. And of course, kinship traditions um, led to the intermarriage of Western traders with indigenous women, and that resulted in a distinct people, the Métis. And this was an enduring relationship. Extending up until the 1980s, Fort Mackay First Nation, one of the chiefs is telling a story about how in the 1970s, 1980s, you would have a household with $45,000 in annual income. And because of the loss of the fur trade, which he blames on the environmentalists and their disparagement of the fashion, in 1985, it was down to $17,000. So you can take that as you will. Anyway, Canada was organized in 1867 by an amalgamation of the four provinces. The BNA, BNA Act provided for a government in a similar form to the United Kingdom, but it was a federal uh, constitution, and it divided areas of legislative authority being the federal government in Section 91 and provincial government in Section 92. Consistent with earlier imperial policy, the federal government, located in Ottawa, was given a jurisdiction over Indians and lands reserved for Indians in Section 9124 on the basis that he couldn't really rely on local um, policy provinces to effectively manage the uh, Indian question, as they called it. That didn't mean that uh, provincial governments didn't have any relevant um, authorities. Um, they had jurisdiction over property and civil rights in the province uh, in Section 91, 92 sub 13, and they owned the lands and rights in the province in Section 109, but that was, of course, subject to existing trusts. So from 1863 to 1870, Canada negotiated to acquire Prince Rupert's land and Britain's Northwest Territories, and it resulted in a three-way transaction between Canada, Britain, and the Hudson's Bay Company, which saw Hudson's Bay Company surrendering its charter back to Britain on terms. Britain would accept that surrender and transfer Rupert's lands to, and its northwest ter northwestern territories to Canada. And Canada would pay the surrender terms to Britain, who would forward it on to Hudson's Bay Company. In actual fact, Britain loaned the funds to accomplish this transaction. Of course, the indigenous nations played no role in this transfer. So, 8 November 18, uh, 19, 1869, Hudson Bay Company surrendered its charter to Great Britain for 300,000 pounds, various land grants, and an indemnity for any claims of Indians for compensation for lands required for the um, purpose of settlement. And the whole point of acquiring the Northwest Territories and Prince Rupert's land, of course, was to extend the settlement out to Western Canada because of the land pressures and the resulting dispersal down to the United States as land hungry farmers at the time, they had nowhere to go. So the surrender was accepted um, by Britain, uh, and in on June 1870, and it was the actual and it was effective uh, July 15, 1870. In fact, it was delayed by the first rail resistance, and only uh, transferred effectively on uh, December 1870. So Canada had agreed, when it got those territories, it would negotiate with the, uh, consistent with the unique equities that have governed Britain, the British Crown with dealing with Aboriginals. And that was a reference, by the way, to the Royal Proclamation of uh, 1763, which set the basis of Canada's uh, policy where the Crown would have a monopoly on acquiring Crown, Indigenous lands and um, 
that will be procedurally protected by a, a meeting organized for that purpose um, to negotiate these treaties. So the federal government, uh, in accordance with this agreement, set out to negotiate indigenous nations and all of its new lands. And so it negotiated 11 numbered treaties from 1871 to 1921. Sorry. This is the, the purple areas are um, the numbered treaties, as you can see. There are other pre Confederation treaties um, in Nova Scotia. But the yellow areas are areas where there were no treaties. And it should be noted that Native reserves are still being allocated in Alberta in 2017. They're being surveyed and allocated. And of course, the yellow areas. So the number of treaties were based on the Ontario Robinson Treaties and from the 1850s. And they were framed as, in Canadian law at least, land surrender treaties. Those land surrender treaties um, had identical terms. And in those treaties, uh, Indigenous nations surrendered their rights to huge tracts of land. And Treaty 8 is larger than France, for example. In return for promises that they continue their traditional way of life on surrendered lands, right, subject to those lands being taken up and used for a different purpose, in which case they would be withdrawn from their rights to hunt and fish and do a conduct a traditional way of life. And lands based on population would be reserved for their exclusive use. And these were called Indian reserves. And I'm sure some of you know it, but what percentage of Canada's territory is now reserved for Indigenous nations? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Sorry. Don't be embarrassed. One percent. What about anybody else have another guess? All right. It's actually one quarter of one percent. So we, in 400 years, Indigenous nations have gone from controlling 100% of Canada's territory to one quarter of 1%. And in return, they also got annual annuities and agricultural hunting supplies and other benefits. But of course, those agreements were breached. Uh, the toxic combination of government penury, in other words, they don't want to spend as much as required, neglect, in not adequately uh, surveying Indian population. Uh, and Indian in, in, in nations' political powerlessness to enforce those terms left most of those treaty promises, in fact, the Royal Commission says almost all of them, um, unfulfilled and still subject to dispute. So Treaty 7, which is where, where we are occupied, was signed in September 22nd, 1877, between Canada and the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Blood, Pagan, and Blackfoot uh, First Nations, the Sutsina, uh, otherwise known as the SRC, and the Sto Stony Nakota First Nation, Bearspaw, Chiniki, and Good Stony Wesley Nations. With the signing of the treaties, however, they became subject to the Indian Act. So, the Indian Act, um, it dates from 1876. It's based on a compilation of pre-Confederation legislation dealing with uh, Indian lands and is substantially unchanged to this day. And the focus of the Indian Act is on uh, protection and management of Indian reserves that were held in trust by the federal government for the benefit of the First Nations. The Indian Act required registration of Indians into bands and distributed benefits and imposed restrictions on the basis of that status, whether they are a member of an Indian band or not. It imposed government trusteeship for Indian band monies and resources derived from the reserves on the basis that Indians could not manage themselves. They were technically minors children in the eyes of the law. It criminalized indigenous religious practices. 
Sundance on the prairies, potlatch on the coast. Indigenous governance was replaced by elected officials, chiefs and band councils with limited powers. And by the way, the only ones entitled to vote in those elections were the men until recently. All powerful Indian agents controlled all of the band monies and distribution of the benefits on the reserves at that time. There from 19, from the start of it uh, until 1951. Their permission was required, uh, for example, to travel on or leave the reserve, the past system, um, inherit any property, personal property, uh, or transact any business with Indians. Indians had no right to vote, except in band council elections, unless, quote, they gave up their status. The right to vote in federal elections came in 1960. In contrast, women gained the right to vote in 1919. Indians didn't have the right to vote. And provincially, in the 1960s. Alberta was the second last to do that, Quebec being the last. It criminalized the hiring of lawyers to advance Indian claims or raising funds to do so from 1927 until 1951. So even if you could make a claim, right, you couldn't hire a lawyer to do it without permission of the Indian Department, which of course was never given. And there was an express policy of assimilation. This was best expressed by Duncan Campbell Scott. That policy was to continue until there's not a single Indian in Canada who has not been absorbed into the body politic and there's no Indian question and no Indian department. That was express government policy. A key component of that was the Indian residential schools, which saw contracting for missionary teachers. They're the only ones who'd work for the pay that the government was willing to provide um, because they had an alternate uh, an additional motivation. And children were, indigenous children were transported, compelled to attend boarding schools off of their reserve, away from their home. At its peak in 1927, and Alberta, by the way, had the largest proportion of uh, Indigenous children in residential schools, the Indigenous sc residential schools held one-third of all status Indians. So children were compelled to attend boarding schools. They were housed in deplorable conditions, subject to abuse, including sexual abuse and food abuse. And teachers prohibited them from speaking their native languages, taught them to reject their indigenous culture and traditions as being, quote, inferior, and recoil from their ancient uh, indigenous spirit spirituality as devil worship. They wouldn't allow them to talk. They taught them in English or French. And any graduate of the indigenous residential schools either went back to their reserve, right? But they were aliens. They couldn't speak their parents' language. They couldn't communicate. And if they went to uh, urban areas, they would consist, migrated to, uh, as a permanent underclass. So five generations. So count that. You, your parents, your grand grandparents, your great great grandparents, and your great great grandparents were all trapped in these Indian residential schools. And so, and when children are impressionable, if you're not loved, if you don't receive any sort of support, what do you do? You don't learn to love. You don't learn to um, express your feelings. You blame yourself. And that damage is incalculable. And it's continuing. And this was the basis of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So, Indigenous waters. The Indian Act and historical treaties were silent as to Indigenous rights in water. And this meant that the common law doctrine of riparian rights, uh, which gave property, uh, 
in the water use to adjoining landowners, and in that case, the federal crown for the benefit of the First Nations, uh, would apply on reserves. And, but in order to encourage settlement in uh, arid areas, the Federal Northwest Irrigation Act, 1894, replaced riparian rights in Canada's Northwest Territories. Remember the lands that were acquired um, from the Hudson's Bay Company. And it claimed crown ownership of those waters by the federal crown, surface waters by the federal crown. And the original act attempted to eradicate common law riparian rights by requiring all current water users, including the riparian users, to apply for a license to validate their uses within one year of the enactment. Of course, that generated a whole flashback, and it was amended subsequently in 1895 to not require licenses for riparian water uses. The Act established a perpetual water license scheme uh, for a certain amount of water, for, um, for a certain purpose, attached to land. And these were perpetual. And water use was allocated on the basis of priority of registration. So if you had um, a senior license, which was registered before a subsequent license, you would have the right to use all of your water allocation before any of it was sent down to the junior water license. And of course, when Alberta was established in 1905, um, the federal government wanted to continue the homestead program uh, for colonization. And unlike other provinces, they did not transfer to uh, the Crown or the province of Alberta uh, the rights and royalties in the uh, Alberta and instead just provided a, a subsidy for uh, Alberta government operations. Of course, this was intolerable. And this was changed by a constitutional amendment called the uh, Natural Resources Transfer Act, um, which transferred to the province uh, mines, minerals, royalties in the prairie provinces, uh, accepting federal lands such as reserves, national parks, uh, etc. Surface waters were transferred. They, they originally missed the waters in the original transfers, and they were subsequently transferred in uh, the Natural Resource Transfer Agreement Amendment Act, 1945. Interestingly, ground waters were never transferred to Alberta. Alberta continued the scheme of water licensing in the Northwest Irrigation Act in 19... Uh, 31 with the promulgation of the Alberta Water Resources Act. It was identical to the Northwest Irrigation Act. In 1962, amendments uh, to the water law in Alberta declared Alberta's ownership of groundwater. Okay. Um, and so the current uh, water allocation statute is Alberta's Water Act 1996, which became effective of uh, January 1, 1999. In it, it continued the individual domestic use exemption from licensing. It created a modest traditional agricultural use exemption. Uh, so if you proved you could farm uh, in a traditional, you'd get a small amount of water. And it also grandfathered the existing licenses in the existing order. It also required the development of water basin frameworks to manage water supply, set the amount that uh, could be extracted from the waters. Uh, and it also allowed, it unmoored the water licenses from land ownership. So you could transfer uh, unused water allocation um, between licenses on a temporary basis, you know, or on a term basis. And it enabled the director of the water to adjust licenses, quote, in an emergency. Now, water myths. Canada has 20% of the world's fresh water. Wonderful. Okay. But only 6.5% of the world's water supply is renewable. The balance of all that other 20% is held in glaciers, underground lakes, lakes, 
um, and permafrost. So okay, yeah, well, six and a half percent isn't too bad, but 60% of that water supply goes to the north. It flows into the Arctic and Hudson's uh, Bay. So in the result, it's unavailable to 85% of the Canadian people uh, that live along the southern border. <coughs> in Alberta, 80% of Alberta's fresh water supply is in the northern part of the province, draining north, right? Whereas 80% of the demand is in the southern part of the province. So we don't have a water, uh, unlimited water supply. And of course, Alberta's water allocation scheme is first in time, first in right. The current licensing scheme, though, does not encourage water conservation. There's no requirements to limit your uh, production. There's no requirements to use any particular technology. Uh, there's no, and you can't lose it unless you commit one of the, you know, offenses, which are, nobody ever does, under the Act. So they're essentially perpetual. The current water licensing scheme, as of 2009, um, is distributed in various uses. The most significant one is agriculture, irrigation. 42, half of, almost half of Alberta's water is used for irrigation. And by the way, irrigation is a consumptive use, right? Very little of that water returns to the watershed. Unlike hydropower or even industrial uses or municipal uses, they're essentially um, flow-throughs, right? But almost half of Alberta's water is consumed in the irrigation sector. And this, by the way, is without any re conservation required. So the first time Alberta experienced a water shortage was in the Dust Bowl era of the 1930s. And I haven't been able to determine this, um, but I believe that's when water licenses exceeded supply levels. Because, right? of course, we had the dirty 30s and the Dust Bowls, the drought. But rather than change the water allocation system at that time, right, Alberta embarked on this ambitious program of retraining increasing the reusable water supply by storing water behind dams and reservoirs. Over $1 billion were expended between uh, 1930 to 1990 uh, on water projects. All the while, Alberta continued to issue standard water licenses. But we've reached the limit of suitable storage, at least major suitable storage sites for uh, waters at least in southern Alberta. And the transfers in the Water Act between um, existing licenses, that's a safety valve, but it doesn't increase the actual supply of water. In fact, it actually increases the incentive for uh, prudent users of water, right? Because they get money for their unused water supply. So they're gonna want the system to continue. And the current South Saskatchewan River Basin is currently over allocated. All the water licenses, all the, if, if any allocation, um, the, any water allocation has been licensed and over licensed. It's the same thing, by the way, in the uh, Athabasca River, right? With uh, water licenses for various oil sands projects, um, being granted um, to something like 120% of the annual flow. Now, Alberta has uh, made a moratorium for uh, new licenses in the South Saskatchewan uh, River Basin, uh, and it's made subsequent exceptions to serve First Nations needs, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, and enhance in-stream flows. In-stream flows are those um, waters that are required to support and environment. They're the ones that do the um, do all the work in providing um, a safe environment and also for storage to um, build new uh, water resorts, reserves. And also the Alberta Land Stewardship Act um, uh, 2012 governs lands and waters uh, 
on, based on a regional planning model, which are set as the uh, river basins, the five river basins in Alberta. And the current South Saskatchewan uh, regional plan uh, has been approved in, 19, in 2014. But climate change will further limit the water supply. So this is the observed impact of um, temperature, the average annual land and ocean surface temperature from to the current date. And this is from the uh, International Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change uh, 2014. For those of you who are adherents of, uh, what is it, citizen science or uh, whatever, and are climate denialists, there is a good website, in fact, an excellent website, that addresses all of those arguments, all of the arguments that climate denialists have advanced. It's called Skeptical Science. So. And of course, the Northern Hemisphere, right, has more land than the Southern Hemisphere. And land heats up faster than water. So, the observed impacts over the past hundred years, right? Oh, shoot. The uh, temperature has increased um, by 1.4% since 1910, 1970. Most of the change comes from 1970. Between 1912, you know, this low, low line, the average in the um, south was 1.1% per decade, right? In the north, um, it was 2% uh, per decade in the north. Starting in 1970, it's now changed to 3% or 0.3 degrees um, per decade in both the North and South basins. Summer flows. Summer flows, of course, are when you want the most water. It's the most usable water. And so the summer flow reduction, a lot of it based on the building up of water reserves or water reservoirs, has been declining since uh, 1910. So in uh, the North Saskatchewan right, River, it's gone from 100% flows to roughly 60% in current times. In the Peace River and uh, the Old Man, it's gone down to, again, 60%. In Sask Saskatoon, the actual amount is 20% of the historical flows. And a large part of that, of course, is uh, additional storage capacity, but not all of it. So, I apologize for the uh, um, poor quality of this slide, but this is a model of the global warming picture. And so the representative concentration pathways, um, the blue lines and such like that, are a mixture of proposed scenarios. So the low one is a str stringent uh, mitigation scenario that aims to keep global warming likely below, below two degrees centigrade by the end of the century, or to you know, pre-industrial levels. And that's embodied in the Paris Agreement. Yeah. There's a two intermediate scenarios um, and one scenario, the red one, where we, with a high concentration of emissions and greenhouse gases. If we don't do anything, right, it'll fall somewhere in between there. But if you note, there's a very small difference by 2050 it's already, quote, baked into Alberta. Global warming is already baked into the world. So in Alberta, this is the projection, right, of the air temperature 
doubling in CO2 concentration projected to have a 6 to 8% rise in temperatures by 2100. It will also cause uh, soil moisture to evaporate and to between 30 to 20, 40 percent in the eastern part of Alberta and 20 to 30 percent in the western part. One of that includes the most obvious one is glacier retreat. Everybody's seen the Athabasca Glacier, which is going back and back and back, right? And glaciers moderate the uh, river flow. They store snow and um, re-inject it back into the river as they melt. But the loss of those glaciers, right, will lead to the lack of that moderating influence, which means increased springtime flows and lower summertime flows. And as I said before, evaporation. This is the model of evaporation up to 2100. So what does that mean? Well, by 2050, the temperature will vary up to 2.7 degrees centigrade and a minim at a minimum 2.19 degrees in 2050. The evaporation is on the west side. So, There's a whole bunch of studies that prove this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. <laughs> um, impact on uh, infrastructure, environment, water competition with scarcity, and the potential for drought. Right. So Indigenous rights were constitutionalized in 1982 when Canada passed um, or Canada repatriated its constitution um, by including a Charter of Rights and Aboriginal rights are included as um, part two of the Constitution. And so these are the Aboriginal rights. Um, but what does existing and what do the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights consist of? You know, what does that mean? The courts have said that the purpose of Aboriginal rights is to reconcile Indigenous nations with the assertion of Crown sovereignty by Canada. Right? and the de facto control of lands and resources. So this is the mechanism to reconcile the uh, loss of Canada's rights of indigenous nations. So the, existing, what the meaning of existing and um, Aboriginal, Aboriginal treaty rights was decided by the Supreme Court of Canada in 1990. And they said that any existing rights as of April 1, 1982, were protected. And extinguished rights were not protected. Aboriginal rights can be extinguished with a clear federal legislation um, doing so. So the question becomes, have Indigenous water rights uh, survived to 1982? Remember the Northwest Irrigation Act, which formed the basis of Alberta's water license allegation? It didn't talk about water rights on Indian reserves. Um, and it did not apply to any agreement existing at that time. So, of course, on its face, Treaty 7, having been signed uh, in 1877, the Act, on its own terms, would not apply to reserves and continue riparian water rights. And even if the Act applied... The Department of Indian Affairs never applied for water licenses, right, as they were required to do, and that's an ongoing issue today. And finally, there's never been a court case, none, interpreting Indigenous water rights, right? No case. So it's basically an open season. Remember the natural resource transfer agreements and transferring the surface water? They provided an exemption for the Stony Nakoda First Nations, right? In the actual act, the constitutional act. So any consideration of water allocation should, I would argue, reflect Indigenous perspectives, given the holistic and complete nature of those perspectives. And 
consideration of indigenous water rights is probably legally mandated, at least in certain cases.